everybody, welcome to the November 10th, 2017 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Duzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on a breaking KUNC news report that Speaker of the House, Chrysanta Duran, is calling for the resignation of Democratic Representative Steve Lebsock. The report alleges multiple sexual assault allegations against Lebsock. Patty Calhoun from Westward, uh, this is breaking this morning. It's 12.15 it's, it's, uh, in the afternoon here on Friday as we tape, so there might be other details to come out before this actually hits broadcast at 8 o'clock. From what we know now, at the very least, Chrysanta Duran calling for resignation. Uh, what's your reaction? Well, my reaction is a big surprise. What took everyone so long to recognize the kinds of harassment that have gone on for generations, not just in business, not just in Hollywood, but in politics? It probably took, uh, what it took was Chrysanta Duran, a speak, female Speaker of the House, to go up front on this. If anyone, male, female, transgender, whatever, has a bad incident in their past, I'd highly suggest they not run for political office right now, or even better, just not do anything bad. Very good point. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. When we see a headline, again, as details are developing, of a Speaker of the House and a fellow Democrat of uh, Steve Lebsack calling for his resignation, uh, what does that mean to you? It means they want to wait and find out more facts. This is, the, this incident is that at the end of, le end of the session, legislative party in 2016, that towards the end of the evening, he got too aggressive about trying to convince Representative Faith Winter to leave the bar with him and, and was too aggressive about that. So according to the, the story, she filed a complaint about that uh, shortly after it happened. I'd like to know what happened with the complaint. How was, how was that resolved, this thing that was filed over a year ago? Um, I always think about something that Representative, former Representative Ken Gordon said at this table. He said, you know, as a lawyer, I have situations all the time where somebody comes into my office and says, here's how some situation happened. You want to represent me. And what he said he's learned from experience is you don't always take that as being initially accurate, even if the person's sincere. You want to find out more uh, before you, you make a professional decision. So I, I'd like to learn more before make, making up my mind. One of the many wise things Ken Center show. It's a good point. Joey Bunch from Colorado Politics. Uh, this seems like a pretty big deal when you see the Speaker of the House come out against this, against, especially with a fellow Democrat. Not that you can, couldn't play politics with this, but if it's Republican, at least you kind of go with that different uh, angle, I guess. But when it's a fellow Democrat, it seems like a bigger deal to me. What do you think? Well, I think I agree with Dave Copel on, on several points on this. We don't have all the facts yet, but I think one thing that we can say for certain is that it's not a good day for, um, for Steve Lebsock's political career, and it's not a good day for his marriage either. Uh, whatever comes of this, there apparently there were a lot of witnesses to this incident at the bar, uh, including Representative Alec Garnett. So Steve Lebsock at that point had already announced that he was running for state treasurer. So, you know, I question his judgment then we'll wait and see about his innocence. Ben Gill, public affairs consultant. Uh, you see a headline like this uh, attached to a Speaker of the House, and that it puts a little more heft to it. It's, it's not just the complaint coming out, waiting for the other side. Uh, you're assuming that maybe the Speaker of the House has done a little bit, some of her due diligence. But uh, what is your reaction to the news we've seen break today? Well, I, as everyone else is saying, I, it'll be interesting to see what else comes. Um, the the story from uh, KUNC or, or the Denver Post in front of me uh, says that there are five, nine other lawmakers who are involved in complaints. So it sounds like there's maybe been uh, multiple complaints. I also would presume, to David's point, that Chrysanta Duran, the, the speaker, has maybe seen these complaints and seen some of the um, work or, or investigation or whatever else might be around it. So it speaks volumes that she's urging him to resign. Uh, I suspect that he probably will uh, with this kind of weight behind it. And, um, you know, it's, it's way, way past time for all people to stop this kind of behavior. This is, this is stuff that we learn in preschool and kindergarten about respecting everybody's bubble. So 
you know, I, I think ideally we have a higher bar for elected officials and they continue to sink way under. Results are in for the 2017 election across Colorado. The Teachers Union Bat candidates won a contested race in the Douglas County School Board election, while Denverites approved a $937 million bond package and a controversial green roof initiative. Patty, I'll start with you on this one. Were you surprised by any of the results, whether they be in Denver or the school board races, not only in Douglas County, but around the state? Well, let's deal with Denver first. I was surprised that the green roof initiative passed by as much as it did. I was actually surprised that the GO bonds passed by as much as they did. They were pretty much of a lock. Denver likes to invest in itself. Denverites love this city and they want it to do well. What I got out of the Initiative 300 coming is, Denverites love the city, but they may not run, love the people running the city. They may not love the developers who are all over this city. And they wanted to make a statement which is, you have to do a better job of what you're doing in this city. And that's what I really took away from 300. Douglas County, amazing. Maybe we're coming on the last chapter in the voucher fight, or maybe people are just tired of fighting and they wanted to settle down for a little bit. But there were fascinating results. Aurora City Council, where you had a lot of new progressives who were elected. And going back to 300, what I love most about that, it was petitioned on. They made it by 45 votes, so it's a complete citizen petition. And the guy who pushed it, who's a manager of Red Robin, was inspired by Bernie Sanders. So in Aurora, here in Denver, you see that the response to last year's election was not necessarily not to vote, although we saw plenty of that, but to get involved and get involved locally on a very grassroots level. David, we saw uh, at least uh, headline grabbing results all over the state, whether it be about growth initiatives in the suburbs, uh, things happening in Denver, and of course school board races, which were making national news because of all the national money coming in. Uh, take your pick uh, and tell us your reaction. Well, this shows again that the, the national teachers unions, the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, they are, you know, 800 pound gorillas in Colorado politics. They successfully uh, took over the Jefferson County School Board and now the Douglas County School Board um, and, and others. So the school boards, schools will very strongly be run uh, for the benefit of the union members as the, uh, the, the top priority. Um, and they invested a lot of out-of-state money and uh, their, their investments paid off. In the, uh, on a lot of the, the tax increases like the, the Denver bonds and also school, school bonds in, in, in various districts, uh, that showed the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights at work. Is The Taxpayers' Bill of Rights doesn't say you, you can only have small government. It says but when government grows beyond a certain rate or wants to borrow more money, just ask first. And often when local governments ask and they put together specific proposals about how to spend the money and those make sense to the to the voters uh, voters will approve that so which is absolutely their their right and, and their choice you know Colorado is much more of a keep the government under the direct control of the people than most other states and certainly than the federal government and here we see the people exercising their direct control and their choices Joey, at least a week ago when we were talking about what might happen for Election Day 2017, I don't think many people thought that the Green Roof Initiative in Denver had much of a, of a chance. It, it's, it's not necessarily draconian, but it went to a level further than at least most mainstream uh, analysts were saying that it probably should. Uh, that's probably why it'll fail. But with its passing, is that a, a sign to uh, Denver civic leaders and to Denver developers that uh, citizens may at the very least want to raise the bar of what developers are bringing to the city. Well, absolutely it does. You know, we're in an odd time, and I don't know if it's a trend or a snapshot, but it, Tuesday was a good day to be a Democrat or, and be the backer of a liberal cause across Colorado. We saw school vouchers take a beating in, in, um, in Dugco. We saw fracking take a beating up in Broomfield. Um, Elections have consequences, and I think the consequences that we saw on Tuesday was a consequence of what happened a year before, because elections like this are for the people who show up, and barely, a little more than one in three Coloradans showed up to vote. Not that unusual, but the people who did vote who showed up were motivated, and they seem to be motivated to, let, to the left. Now, does that mean anything about the midterm elections next year? I don't know. A year is an eternity in politics, and a lot of things can still happen between then and now. But if you're a liberal in Colorado, you've got the wind at your back, which is a lot better than having the wind at your face. So we'll see if they can maintain that momentum. You know, we saw candidates, uh, candidates that we thought would win uh, across Colorado who didn't win on Tuesday. 
tons of outside money came in you know at, to the to the point that's already been made all politics is local and now in this election people were willing to put money into local races so let's see what kind of money comes into Colorado next year to swing the pendulum back to the right or keep the momentum to the left Ben you've worked with a lot of actually some of the the sitting city council members in Denver uh, whether it be the campaign or just consulting just you you know a lot of them personally if they give you a call this we can say hey Ben, how, how, do, how should I interpret what happened in Denver on uh, Election Day 2017? What do you say? Well, I think there are some interesting tea leaves to be read. Um, I'll start with Initiative 300. I, I thought that the Green Roof Initiative was seriously backed by, or so helped by the bond initiatives being on the ballot. They all passed overwhelmingly. The structure of the ballot, the, the green roofs thing was right at the end of it, kind of seemed a little bit tacked on. It, it passed with a much smaller margin, but I think that the bonds really helped it. It was uh, H, essentially? It, yeah, I think it was a little bit of an afterthought. I think the more interesting race to analyze for city politicians, and then I'd like to talk about the state a little bit, is the um, at-large school board race, where Barbara O'Brien, who spent close to half a million dollars on her campaign, which she should be embarrassed about, because the two other candidates got combined almost 15,000 more votes than she did. And I think that is bad news for inside incumbent people in the city of Denver. And I think if you're looking for a sign that people in Denver are not thrilled with the status quo, that's the big one. The Kerry Olson race is another good indicator of that here in the city of Denver. Kerry beat an incumbent, Mike Johnson, who's uh, part of a, a big law firm in town and represents um, a lot of that sort of insider position right in the center of Denver, too, in Capitol Hill and in one of the most central uh, affluent neighborhoods. Mike also badly out outspent Kerry um, and lost pretty handily. Um, so I think if you're looking at these races and trying to read the tea leaves, it doesn't bode well for like the mayor, for example. The poor turnout, they spent over I think almost two million dollars pushing those bond initiatives and the fact that they couldn't get it even to 90,000 votes is pathetic. Um, I think as you look around the state, um, as everybody else is saying, yes, the winds were blowing left. Even Colorado Springs passed a bond initiative to pump more money into their school district. So that's always an interesting sign. I think as you look at the oil and gas initiatives especially, that bodes well for the Democratic slate of candidates running for governor. I think most conspicuously in my mind, I think that benefits Jared Polis. He's been the most um, present fighting, pushing back on oil and gas, and I think Pueblo, um, Broomfield, you know, swing areas voting against that bodes well for him uh, and his candidacy. So, yes, good for the left. I think bad for uh, incumbents. And I think given the political mood of the country, nothing, none of that is a surprise. The Jared Polis segue is a wonderful work to our next topic. Cynthia Kaufman announced Thursday she'll be joining the already crowded, and we talked about this like last week being already crowded, Republican primary race for governor. Meanwhile, maybe making it a little less uh, crowded, the Denver Post reports fellow GOP gubernatorial candidate George Brockler may switch to the race for attorney general. David, uh, we've been trying to figure out if Cynthia Kaufman, she was the last really big uh, decision that we needed of what was going to happen for the big governor's race. Now that she's in, how does that affect the slate, especially when you have Tom Tancredo making the big splash last week? Well, it, it's wide open, I, I think. And of course, the conventional wisdom is that Tom, who has a solid base, but and maybe also a ceiling of somewhere between 25 and 30 percent, could in the right circumstances against a, a divided field, uh, that could be enough to, to come into for first place. But we, we'll see. I, th I think we'll, there'll be a convention and petitions and fundraising, and that'll lead to a lot of consolidation. So Tom may have many, many fewer opponents by the time people are, are voting uh, in the primary. Uh, probably a smart move for Brockler. He had a sort of a really good lead in terms of endorsements and being out there and being well known, but was having trouble raising funds and you know, if, if the goal is to get into statewide office, he's got a better chance in a situation where he, he has a real strong chance of being the Republican nominee. But for everybody, for any Republican running next year, I, I think it's like trying to surf on a tidal wave, is you'll find some very skilled people who can stay on top and survive, and they're, they're true champions. But anybody who's one step below that uh, may just get swept under. What we saw in, in Virginia and, and nationally is 
the Republicans were able to get out their vote and actually improved on their vote totals compared to comparable races in previous cycles. Ed Gillespie, the Republican candidate for governor of Virginia, won among independents. But he did the race was not close and Virginia Democrats did very well making huge gains in, in the lower house of the legislature that nobody had expected because Democratic turnout particularly in the northern Virginia suburbs was so incredibly high we can now say that Hillary Clinton greatly depressed Democratic turnout in the last election and now that she's not around anymore mostly thanks be to God um, it's really you, you take that millstone off of Democratic turnout, and at the same time, Trump, who annoys people a lot anyway, now being president instead of a candidate, is more omnipresent and then all the more annoying to the kind of people he annoys. And he hasn't done a very good job about moderating his rhetoric or, you know, acting like a 16 year old rather than a petulant nine-year-old uh, in a lot of his tweeting. So that, of course, incites Democratic turnout. And that's what it was, is the Democrats won not because Republicans changed their mind or independents came over to them, but because they got their vote out in a huge way, same as Obama did uh, in, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Joey, so... Of the, of the people who are in the Republican primary right now for governor that are, I, I would say, the big names, and, and no offense to some of the folks that are on the eight-person ballot, but we know there's some big names probably going to be there at the end. Does Cynthia Kaufman arrive as the anti-Tancredo moderate, so that if you don't want to go really right as a Republican primary voter and you want a moderate Republican, is she that answer or is it somebody else? No, 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 it's Walker Stapleton's that answer. I think that Cynthia is not as far to the right as Tom Tancredo, but she's probably about three quarters of the way there. You know, on the morning she announced, somebody tweeted out a picture, a GIF of her, um, am I pronouncing that right? I don't know, I'm not cool like hey, Patty. It Dick. depends which side <laughs> by 25, it's GIF or JIF, it really yeah, doesn't know. Well, yeah. she, uh, she's, uh, you know, she's shouting go Trump on there. And you remember Tom Tancredo and, um, and Cynthia Kaufman were the two of the three that tried to force Steve House out as the Republican Party chairman over, uh, allegedly over a, a, a a blackmail seg blackmailing him over a sex scandal and it didn't work so she and Tancredo are running buddies they'll divide that conservative vote how many of those votes she can take away of Tancredo from Tancredo will be good for uh, Walker Stapleton but I and I may be on the outsides on uh, at this table but I believe that we're going to get to the primary with four or five Republicans on the ballot I think Tom's going to be there I think uh, Walker Stapleton is going to be there maybe Cynthia uh, uh, Victor Mitchell's got $3 million, and he's building momentum, and uh, Victor Mitchell's a candidate to keep your eye on, and we could see Doug Robinson there. That's four people who have to beat one person. So the real winners, again, on, on Tuesday, the Democrats and the liberals across the state won, and on Wednesday, when Cynthia Kaufman got in this race, they won because they, um, you know, they, they helped Tom Tancredo get across that finish line if she, uh, unless she takes a lot of votes from him. And if Tom Tancredo is the nominee for the Republicans, Democrats have a lot easier time because, let's remember, the reason he got in this race was because of the alt-right and because a convention that he was supposed to speak at in Colorado Springs put on by the people who were affiliated with the people who put on Charlottesville, Virginia on that, that protest, you know, he's going to be linked to all that. And Tom Tancredo, you know, you don't have to look far to put together an opposition ad and, uh, against Tom. So it's another good day for Democrats. It's not a deep Google search. Uh, ben, <coughs> what is, uh, I guess, who has the best news right now, the best chances? Cynthia Kaufman entering the GOP gubernatorial primary or George Brockler contemplating the attorney general GOP primary? I think George, hands down. Uh, he ought to get out of the governor's race, and it looks pretty clearly like he's going to. He's getting squeezed out. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Joey's analysis. I think... Uh, Democrats across the state are going to go Tom go. I think probably the only better scenario for Democrats sees anybody else win the Republican primary and Tancredo decide to run as an independent again. Then you're pretty much minting whomever the Democratic nominee is. So uh, certainly I think George is going to exit and probably get the nominee for Attorney General. Um, I know that there's conversation uh, with him and, and uh, a state rep who's considering it, and I think he'll be able to back that person out. And I think the clown car is good news for Dems. Patty, uh, who's happier right now at Cynthia Kaufman jumping in the race, Tom Tancredo or Walker Stapleton? 
I would say it's Walker Stapleton, but we have to remember when you have a ca so many clowns in this car, what we're going to get coming out of the car is going to be a clown. <laughs> so n at the primary, we're going to be looking at an extraordinary number of people on the ballot, even at four or five, but you're also going to have the possibility of unaffiliated voters going in and voting in this primary too, who could swing it in a number of ways. Will people be so cynical as to say, let's vote for the person who is going to torpedo the Republican Party, or is it going to be just whoever happens to strike their fancy? Tancredo got 36 percent of the vote running as an independent, or not, as a uh, third party candidate, and I wouldn't put it past him to do it again. So Democrats right now are going to have to play a waiting game just to keep doing everything they can for their own candidacy, but it's, it's so up in the air which Republican could win, and then will there only be the two parties represented? It's true. I do want to assure all of our audiences that we have been uh, equally uh, calling the Democratic uh, primary uh, lineup a clown car uh, with the possible risk of offending clowns out there. We've said both <laughs> Democrats and Republicans are deserve, uh, a clown car. So uh, on to a quick take on this last topic. The U.S. House approved a mental health bill for veterans this week that was sponsored by Representative Mike Kaufman. The Veteran Urgent Access to Mental Health Care Act mandates that the VA provide health assessments and continued care for those that were less than honorably discharged. Joey, your quick take on this, does it have a chance of passing? I hope it does. It passed the House unanimously. And good for Mike Kaufman to recognize that the root causes of why a lot of people are discharged is their mental health. And this will, help, this will broaden the assessments of those. In addition to helping people get care, it'll help identify those people before they are kicked out of the service. Uh, ben, your quick take on this. Uh, do, do we think this is going to get to President Trump's desk? I think it will, and I think this is another thing that Representative Kaufman is hoping and praying he can wave in front of voters' faces to distract them from all the bad votes and bad policy he's been pushing over the years. <laughs> Patty, your take on what we're seeing from Representative Mike Kaufman. So cynical. I will say this is a good bill, even if it is good politics for Kaufman. Let's hope it makes it to Trump's desk. Let's hope it's signed and off Trump's desk. David, wrap it up for us. A, a great bill to provide mental health care for people who need it, which is an important investment in our society. It saves a lot of money, often in prison costs and things like that uh, down the road. And it's an example of how Representative Kaufman is a, a, a workhorse rather than a show horse in Congress. Let's get to our favorite part of the show. As always, Disgrace of the Week. Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. Well, first, I think we should take up a collection for David to go see Hillary Clinton when she's in town <laughs> next week. We already bought him the book, I figured. Yeah. Well, I think, I think in person. Yeah. But uh, last week, we were talking about mental health, shootings. We reached a new, very sad milestone this week with the shootings in Texas, which knocked Columbine out of the top 10 for major shootings and loss of life, that Columbine doesn't even rate the top 10 anymore, which is such a horrific sign of the times. David. Sexual predators, um, most of them aren't, don't get money from the Colorado taxpayers, but Harvey Weinstein, got five, who's worth over a quarter of a billion dollars and already has a lot of money, got $5 million from the Colorado Film Welfare Board, a disgraceful uh, spending of our money to give to that guy. That's a long way around the barn to say he went to Harvey Weinstein, but I, I understand the point. Joey. Well, Roy Moore, Judge Roy Moore, the Senate candidate, is not my disgrace of the week. He's my runner-up for disgrace of the week because my disgrace of the week is the state of Alabama that continues to elect these kinds of characters, these guys who wave around the Bible, get into public office, and we find out who they really are. You know, their governor in Alabama, the love gov, he was uh, messing around with one of his staffers and wound up having to leave office. You know. It's, it's a tradition in the Deep South that needs to end. And Alabama voters, the, my people, if you're listening, just stop it. You're disgracing me. Ben. I'm going to say the voters of Colorado, and I'll, I'll put the voters of Denver on the spot in particular, fewer than 90,000 votes, guys. There are over 450,000 ballots that went out. That is a pathetic turnout. You can't complain if you don't vote. Let's say something nice about somebody. Patty. Uh, Veterans Day. Today is the holiday, but, but the official day is tomorrow. There will be a parade in town. Thank you for your service. Sorry your treatment by the VA has been so bad. Let's support them as much as we can. Here, here. David. This is the uh, 20th anniversary of the week the Berlin Wall fell, so it's been down now as long as that symbol of communist evil and tyranny was up. And places that are real workers' paradises don't have to put up walls to keep people from fleeing. Joey. 
I'm stumped. I got nothing good to say about anybody. You know, the election, one election just ended. We started the campaigns for next year, and there are no saints and angels in, uh, in politics. I'm, my person is going to be Patty Calhoun. <laughs> Patty Calhoun has been an institution and an inspiration for journalism in this city for hundreds of years. And Patty, I hope I live longer than you so I can put up the statue. <laughs> here, here, Joey. Ben. I think we can all drink to that. Yeah. Um, I'll say Tay Anderson. There's a nice young man in politics. Tay Tay Anderson is a 19-year-old young man who ran for Denver School Board and lost. He only ran because the Denver School Board would not provide a student seat, a non-voting student seat to students. And he said, this is not right. We need student representation. He ran. He did his absolute best. And I look forward to seeing him again in the future. Here, here. That is all the time we have for this edition of Cardo Inside Out. Be sure to tune in to CPT 12 tomorrow as we commemorate Veterans Day. Beginning at 1 p.m., we offer a great lineup of specials. We kick the night, we kick the day off with uh, Hang Tough with a whole story about Dick Winters. And if you're a fan of Band of Brothers, you know exactly who Dick Winters is. That continues till 6 p.m. And then at 6 p.m., we continue that marathon on 12.2. So really, uh, a, a really great marathon of wonderful uh, run the gamut Veterans Day programs that we're very proud of share as our thank you to every every veteran service out there as always log on to facebook or twitter for our cio segments past and present you can also find our podcast that's right the podcast is back on itunes and google play we had some server issues for a while there so sorry about that uh, and i would just say it was it was great to see all the say something nice as i would echo every single one of them uh, it is uh, great to be part of this panel and thank you for all the the great say something nice especially joey's i i i, I like to be there for the patty calhoun staff commemoration myself. I think that Denver would be better for it. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching. Good night.